Can you guys see that? Let's see here. Is that big enough? Okay, so I thought I'd try to uh, do a, a, a tutorial with code uh, just so we could do some experiments and kind of get a feeling for uh, uh, what actually happens. <laughs> So um, I'm going to talk about conditioning on covariates, uh, which you know is something we all do. Uh, it might be just too simple, so if it is, we'll just fly through it, and you guys will be at lunch soon. Uh, but you know, these are mistakes that I've seen that come up a lot in papers, uh, including you know my own papers recently. Uh, so so um, you know, I'm not going to point out papers that have made a lot of the mistakes that I'm going to go through because I don't need to call out individuals, but I'm sure you'll recognize uh, uh, some of the things people do with covariates and the claims they make uh, uh, based on the covariates they include or do not include. Um, these are going to include things like PC covariates or just covariates that we throw into regressions. Um, and we've got uh, Saron here, a card-carrying statistician, so he'll keep me honest uh, uh, if I say something wrong. Um, so I was just going to start with a very simple experiment. Um, I'm going to use the board too a little bit. So we're going to have some genotype uh, G and some phenotype Y. And we'll draw sort of their causal graph like this. So there's no edge pointing between either one of these things. We've just got G and we've got Y. And we'll start doing uh, here. This, OK, so I, I'm assuming most people know a bit of R. I'll just walk through this one once. They all kind of build off of the same uh, little baseline code here. So here's some sample size n. Here's a vector that's going to hold p values. And here's some i that's going to denote an iteration that we're on. And we're just going to kind of loop through the code. So we're going to increment i. Uh, so we're in the first iteration. We're going to draw some genotypes from a random binomial. We're going to draw y from a random normal, so everything's you know nice and happy for a regression. And then uh, we're going to uh, do this regression, um, and then this is just some R uh, uh, notation to say get out the p-value. So in the co in the results array, in the second row, in the fourth column is the p-value of this uh, uh, regression. And then we're going to ask um, um, in this uh, uh, p-value array here, what fraction of the time is a p-value less than 0.05? So, so who knows what fraction of the time a p-value is going to be less than 0.05 under the null? Yeah, yeah, 5%, yeah, yeah, 0.05, right? So, so let's just make sure, all right, so of course it's not going to work because I'm uh, talking in front of everybody, but let's just see what happens here. Maybe I can make this bigger, too. Can you see that? Yes? All right. OK. So maybe it'll take a little bit, but um, OK. So this is what the results are going to kind of look like here. I'll move it up towards the center of the screen, right? As time's going on, we're approaching 0.05, right? So everything is, is kind of cool. All right, so this is under the null. And now we'll make it just uh, slightly <laughs> more interesting. Uh, we have the same kind of setup here, except now the genotypes have some effect, right? So they influence Y. So I'll run uh, uh, the same thing again. All right. And now we see that the fraction of times that the p-value is less than 0.05 is much larger than 5% of the time. And that's because we have some power to detect the association between the genotype and the outcome, and, and things are behaving uh, uh, you know, like we want. Maybe we don't have great power, but we have some power. So this is, this is what a regression looks like under an alternate. OK, so now let's put in a covariate. Um, so here's the sort of causal. So this last one, this, this last one we had this arc from, from g to y. And now I'm going to add in uh, uh, some covariate. So in this last regression, we had sort of this thing happening. So we have g influencing y. And I'm going to add in some covariate uh, c. 
So this covariate is also going to have an effect on y. Okay? But it has no effect on g. It's completely independent from g. Okay, so here again I have the same effect and now I have some covariate and now I'm going to run two regressions. I'm going to run one regression where I don't include this covariate where I just do my regression on the genotypes. So this is the PVU for PV, P values unconditional and here's PVC which stands for P values conditional on the covariate C. So who's got a guess which one of these two is going to be a more powerful test? The unconditional? Conditional. All right, well, people disagree, so that's good. So, so we can see who's right. OK. So this one, let's move this up so people can see. So this is the index we're on. This is the unconditional test, and this is the conditional test. So the conditional test has more power than the unconditional test. So what's going on here is that the power to detect an association between genotype and outcome y is a function of the variance explained of y by g. Now when we condition on the covariate c, we're modeling out some of the variance of y that's independent of the genotype g. So we've shrunk y but we've left in all of G. So when we're looking for the association, we've increased our power because we've you know, r shrunk the variance of Y without r removing any of the signal of G. And so the power goes up, in this case, quite a bit because the covariate has a very large effect on Y. All right, so, so in this instance, you know, it's sort of a non-traditional use if you sort of go back and reread your epidemiology textbooks on why you include or don't include covariates, but, but it, you know, it is a legitimate use and it's a way to increase our power of detecting an association. Okay. So now let's look at um, maybe a slightly more realistic case here. So we have G and some E influence Y. <coughs> So here's something out there in the environment that actually is the causal factor that's influencing Y. And we don't get to see that. But what we do get to see is something else, C. And E has an effect on C. So C is the covariate we measure. E is this causal factor that's influencing Y. And G is this genotype that's influencing Y. <coughs> Okay, uh, and then I'm going to run the same two tests, the unconditional and conditional test. So maybe this is a more realistic example of the types of covariates we measure in the world. We don't get the exact causal factors for the outcome Y. So, so w what do we think? Unconditional or conditional are the same? Yeah? Yeah, that's right. So what exactly structurally you, I mean, in, in the mass or in the you, you did now? So I'm saying, here, here let's, let's, you can see the model right here. So we're saying the genotypes are some random binomial. E is this env is some random normal. And then C, this covariate, is a function of the environment plus some noise. And Y is a function of the genotypes plus this environment, but not the, the covariate directly plus some noise. Okay? So now we can. And the question, and the, so again, what is the question? And the question is whether the power of, of uh, the association between genotype and Y in this framework is going to be more or less or the same uh, in, in this. Uh, in this regression. So are, are we doing a smart thing by including the covariate or not in, in this uh, uh, sort of framework? And, and so... The covariate is between C and Y. 
now that the covariate is between C and Y. Um, so uh, that's the same one as before. Hang on. So, so okay. Okay, so again, it looks like we've done a good thing by including these covariates. Right? So now I've given a couple different examples of situations in which including a covariate uh, uh, is a good thing, right? We throw in these covariates that are independent of G. They capture some of the uh, uh, noise of Y without touching G. And, and so uh, we've done a really good thing. We've increased our power. Yeah? Uh, you can you can uh, you can almost make it a bad thing. You can it's it's a bit of a struggle, but you can s slightly reduce your power if uh, C is r sort of really terribly independent by putting a lot of noise. But generally, the worst you do is get back to the same power. Um, Okay, so so now um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna uh, uh, introduce a situation. Yeah. Are you making statements about the you're gonna get a bad estimate for this Y effect, or is it just only about power? So this is just about power. I, I don't want to talk about effect size estimates because they. I, I, I want to talk about about power. I want I want to talk about power and bias. So let's just think about z-scores and, and not about effect size estimates for today. There are issues there. Uh, that, that there's m more things I want to talk about in terms of power. And um, if there's interest, I can do the effect size one uh, next Friday. Um, so so um, l let's look at this uh, uh, model here. So now we have, let me write this down incorrectly. We have. Uh, E influences Y, G influences Y, uh, E influences C. And now G also has an effect on the covariate. OK? So this is saying, like, G influences uh, HDL cholesterol, and G influences LDL cholesterol. And, and you know these are both things in a metabolic pathway, and I'm interested in LDL cholesterol. And, and should I include HDL as a covariate or not in my analysis when I, you know, in the situation where there's this environmental variable that's influencing HDL and LDL also? Okay. Um, and, and so, so it seems like you know this is really contorted, but people do studies where. They look at type 2 diabetes and include BMI as a covariate, right? This is a really commonly done thing. So even though there's a lot of arrows, I think this isn't such a, uh, a complicated diagram in terms of what, what's actually done uh, in genetics. Uh, what's nice about genetics, right, is there's very few instances where we have an arc going into G, but we'll, we'll look at some of those later. Okay, so, so uh, um, People want to guess what's going to happen now. Is unconditional or conditional a better thing to be doing here? Yes, uh, yes, yes. They, if, if you so right, there's no. Actually, we're not because we're we're just going to look at things that uh, people are doing, period. And under what models are those things good things or bad things? I I, I think it's. Under, under each one of these assumptions, there's like a, a, a correct analysis to carry out, and deciding which one of those things is correct is, is uh, you know, we can spend the whole time on every given causal. So I just want to show that for that there exist underlying causal networks where if we do the standard thing, things can get good or things can get bad, without saying necessarily what's a way to figure all of this out. Yeah. 
y yes, that, absolutely. Yeah, a absolutely. So, so w w we are going to do some of that also. So this is under the alternate. We'll flip this one back under the null in, in a quick second. Yeah. So generally, um, generally w w y y it was like Saron's last question about whether this previous example was always good or whether it could be made bad. And it's true that if you futz with the effect sizes enough, you can make what I showed to be good a very, very little bit bad, but it's tough. Uh, so, so how do you reason that you're <laughs> Not at all. I'm not trying to infer things. I'm just trying to show some things that can happen. Okay? I'm just giving some examples of things that happen in regressions that produce results that people uh, uh, think have written in their papers, this means this. I included this to increase power and show that that's not always true. I've included this to reduce bias or to account for this and in fact increases bias. So I'm just trying to show examples of, of things that people write down in their papers along with claims that they've made about them. Um, and I'm not writing those claims up on the board because I, I don't want to, especially on camera, you know, make examples of people. It happens a lot. Uh, so, so I'm just uh, trying to show s some examples of what can happen uh, just so you can keep in mind when you're introducing covariates that these are examples of things that can happen. Okay. So, so um, in this situation, um, what's happening, right, if we think about these signals, is that the unconditioned is a much more powerful test than the conditional test. And the reason that the conditional test is costing us power is because when we include this C, in our regression, we're removing some of the signal of G. Huh? Even though there's no arc from C to Y, right? there is an arc from G to C. And so now, including this covariate, whereas before it increased our power, when G influences Y, when G influences C, rather, um, including that as a covariate is, is hurting us. So, so including these, these things can, can help or hurt right? in terms of power. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so <coughs> to, to repeat or to uh, sharpen uh, the previous question, uh, I think you, you, you put it, you, sh you, um, you know, I forget, but it's, I'll, I'll do it offline. Fine. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just showing this as an example. We can make another example where the genotype influences the environment. That's absolutely fine, yeah. Um, so I think I just did this one. Okay, so, um, um, so now we have the genotype influences the covariate, the environment influences the covariate. Ah, so here's the null that you wanted, right? And this is a great null. This is a paper from uh, Hugo Achard. It's been pointed out previously, but it, it made a little bit of a splash, especially in the, the UK biobank community. So this is his paper in six lines of R code. I think it's a good, he does a lot more in the paper too, but uh, the, the point is, is kind of uh, consolidated here. And so, so um, now we've, we've, we've put this covariate in, um, and the genotype has no influence on Y, all right? And so, so right, what's our biggest fear in, in running an association study is, is that we're, we report a false positive, right? We don't want to waste everybody's time. This is like the big sin, is, is to report a GWAS hit uh, uh, that's a false positive. And so we try to include these covariates to protect ourselves, right? This is. We, uh, people write like, oh, I added BMI and I added age and gender and blah, 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 just to make absolutely sure and, I, and height even whatever I could come up with to make sure that 
I was not uh, being biased by, by something. Okay, so here we have genotype influencing one of these covariates. So, um, um, and the environment also influences that covariate. And, and we can see, right, there's no genotype in here. And, and we're going to look at these uh, conditional and unconditional uh, uh, powers. OK, right. So this is terrible, right? We've, we've unconditional, we're perfectly fine. We have 5% power. Everything's OK. Um, but then we add in this covariate, and, and all of a sudden we're reporting an association, and we're reporting it as an association between genotype and outcome, even though really the association is between the genotype and the covariate. So what does this mean? I, I add BMI to my type 2 diabetes study because I think type 2 diabetes is so influenced by BMI, I'm going to increase my power. This is going to be great. Uh, but there's a genotype that influences uh, BMI. There's some other environmental factor that influences BMI and influences type 2 diabetes. And the association that I report has nothing to do with type 2 diabetes. It's purely an association between the genotype and BMI. Okay, so. Um, yeah, it's a V-structure problem, right? And, and so uh, this is probably the, the most commonly occurring uh, one we see in genetics, where all kinds of covariates are, are included in the association studies uh, we conduct. And, and the, there's no mention of the fact that, that the, the associations that we're finding may very well be an association to the covariate and, and not to the outcome. Yeah. Uh, so sure. Um, I, I mean, it's tough because you need to get the G to influence the other. I mean, with some population structure, but but y usually we think of E as some um, in environmental variable like this. Oh, I lost the causal diagram. So we have G influencing some covariate. So this is BMI. E is something that influences BMI and type two diabetes. It, it can be. It can be. Yes, that's right. I would argue that we care because now you need to find all these things. That was like the largest G one thing out there. You know, all this connection from. If it's an uh, independent IMLG, and yet you're finding this. Sh sure. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, Yeah, I think that, that right, I'm sort of, yeah, jumping out a little, but that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of a, a really nice thing to do when you're, when you're uh, conducting the association study is to see, especially for the things that you're going to end up reporting, go and look at what happens with your covariates when you, when you change the association. So, so for these things that you're saying are associated, see what happens when you remove BMI. If it completely disappears, you might start asking some questions about what's truly going on. Um, there's some other ways that he goes over in the model to examine this in terms of effect sizes. And so this is the uh, 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 citation that you can sort of read more about this problem. Um, I'm going to try to getting a little bit uh, afternoon here. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about PCA since population structure is kind of w one of the only things we really need to worry about uh, or, or structure in general that, that touches both G and touches Y. Um, so uh, um, first, kind of a little uh, uh, bit of code to orient ourselves. Um, so now we're going to have some number of individuals and some number of SNPs. And I'm going to choose some FST. Um, and then I'm going to choose some array of ancestral minor allele frequencies. So I'm just going to put them all at 0.5. And, and this is, uh, I put it in a loop so it's easier to understand. There's more efficient ways to code this. Uh, but, um, but here's how you can sort of quickly simulate uh, uh, two populations with some FST between them. Use this beta distribution. I think this is in the, 
th this has shown up multiple times. The reference I know for it is, is Price's uh, PCA paper with uh, David Reich as the senior author. So we draw new minor allele frequencies for each population, uh, and then we draw genotypes. And, um, and here's how you do just a standard PCA. You center and scale your genotypes. You make your kinship matrix as uh, ZZ transpose over M. We do an eigen decomposition, and we plot the first eigenvector against the second. And then I'll just replot the points from one of the two populations in red. So because I zoomed in so much, this won't all fit on one screen at once. But uh, so I've made my genotypes now. And um, let's see. And now I'll just grab this here. Um, OK. So you can see, right, here's the two populations. They get separated out by PCA, because this was the only sort of axis of variation. We had plenty of SNPs. And so these two blobs will get sort of further apart as the FST grows, as the number of SNPs grow. Um, well, that's interesting. OK. So, um, okay. so, so let's look at, um, at, at linear regression where we have population structure now. Um, so, so we have 1,000 individuals. We're going to have two genotypes where the allele frequencies now are different in the two populations. And so uh, we combine these two genotypes, and we have an array that denotes the population. And I'm going to change the mean of y as a function of the population. Okay, So we have these two populations. They have two different minor allele frequencies. And the mean of the phenotype is different between the two populations. Um, and, and we're going to look at what happens when we uh, condition on the population. I'm not doing the PCA here, but it's sort of the same. This is intuitively what the PCs are, are, are supposed to represent. And I'm going to see what happens uh, um, <coughs> with, um, oops, with sort of this very uh, uh, standard association analysis with population structure. And so right, uh, this is why we do it. right? So we see when we don't include the population structure as a covariate, we have some power. Even though this is under the null, there is no g touching y. So this is why we include PC covariates when we're doing association studies. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some things that, that PCA can't do. Um, so you know, I came from Czar's lab, so I'm going to talk about relatedness, obviously. So one of the things that PCA can't handle is when we have related individuals in the study. And it's not just a matter of PCA not doing well in terms of identifying the populations here. I'm going to just say that I know exactly which population everybody's in, but I'm going to simulate uh, uh, this sort of perturbed world of uh, 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 twins. So I'm going to have uh, I'm going to take my genotypes and an environmental variable uh, that represents the shared environment, and I'm going to copy the first half of the array, array onto the second. So I have basically two copies of the genotypes because they have twins, and then I'm going to copy the first half of the environment onto the second because they share some of this environmental factor, uh, and then same thing for this other um, set of genotypes and environments, and I'm going to combine them. And then here's the shared environment, right? And so, and now y is again going to have this population structure effect, but there's also going to be an effect of the shared environment. And I'm going to do the same two regressions I did above. Um, so let's copy this. And let's look at what happens. So 
Um, same thing, we have population structure, and so we're inflated, but this time we include our PC covariates, and they don't get us all the way back down to an alpha of 0.05, right? We, we don't get 5%. We're inflated um, under the null, even with PC covariates. And so the point is, when you do these really large studies and you have related individuals in your study um, who have shared environmental terms, you can't just do PCA and expect PC covariates to account for all of the problems that you're going to have. Uh, so um, now uh, one more sort of uh, uh, place where, where PCA doesn't work. Oh, let's see here. Um, so this is something that, that uh, Shaila Musharraf, a, a postdoc in my lab, has been thinking about recently. So we have these two populations. Uh, there's a mean effect, but there's also a difference in variance between population one and population two. So now when I'm drawing the noise, um, um, I'm drawing with a mean zero, but I'm drawing with a variance of one for uh, 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 population one and a variance of, let's see, what is this, four. So this is an extreme example, but it's OK. you know. And then I've got these two minor allele frequencies where the variances of the alleles are quite different between population one or population two. So this one's 0.05 uh, uh, times 0.95, and this one's 0.5 squared. Okay, so, so there's no relatedness here. Um, um, all we have is... Um, all we have is is a different difference in variance between uh, between the the two populations, and so um, let's see where did I put this? I, um, so I'm drawing this QQ plot kind of dynamically as as I uh, um, collect more data points. So this is a QQ plot of the linear regression of uh, with with the PC covariate. So no relatedness. Uh, there's a difference in mean that should be taken care of, but there's also a difference in variance between the two populations. And what you can see is, is that this is sort of clearly off the line here, right? And so uh, what, what PCA assumes is that there's only a difference in mean as a function of the covariates, that there's not a difference in variance between the populations as a function of the PCs. And, and one of the things that we're investigating um, is, is uh, whether or not this happens. And it, it seems like for sort of many population genetic models, um, it's quite difficult to shift the mean without shifting the variance uh, if the reasons for the differences, if the reason for the change is not environmental but in fact genetic. That is, if the genetic effect sizes are different between population one and population two to the extent that they shift the mean, they'll likely also shift the variance. Uh, uh, linear mixed models also won't account for this. They'll still be inflated. And so you need some other uh, uh, model to, to account for the fact that variance of phenotypes changes between populations. Um, let's see. OK, really fast here. Um, um, let's see. Uh, uh, I'll skip this one. Uh, the same thing can happen if if we are doing a liability threshold model where the liabilities change between populations, even if we do uh, logistic regression. So um, um, I'll, I'll skip that. Um, um, OK, this is something that, that uh, um, Saron talked about, which is ascertainment. So now I'm going to. Um, I'm going to ascertain individuals from my study. So this is what we normally do for case control studies, right? I go out into the world and I don't want to, you know, I have this rare disease. It, it takes up 1% of the population or less. So I take 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls to, uh, um, to increase my power um, instead of uh, uh, 1,000 cases and, and, and 100,000 controls. And, and there is some covariate again, that influences why. So without ascertainment, we saw that including this covariate was a really great thing, right? We increased our power. Um, but, but now, so what this is doing is just doing a liability threshold model. So I'm saying the cases are individuals who have, are in the top 500 out of these 50,000 individuals, and the controls are everybody else. And I'm going to sample 500 cases and 500 controls from the uh, uh, genotypes and the covariates, 
and this CC is the case control status, is just the outcome vector. And I'm going to do uh, uh, just um, standard uh, uh, logistic regression. And I'm going to look at a couple uh, different things. I just need to fit this on the screen here. Uh, let me do this, actually. Um, OK. So um, okay. So this, this one isn't such a huge effect, but I think it's enough to sort of give the example. This is the unconditional, and this is the conditional. So we drop our power drops when we condition on the covariate in, this, in the ascertained case from 62% to 53%, whereas before when we included this covariate under the same sort of model where there was no ascertainment, we had gone from, from some number to some number that was much larger, right? And now we're losing power. So again, we, go, we can think about this type 2 diabetes example where BMI has an effect. We include, or we can talk about age in, pro in prostate cancer. You, you know, w most of the people who have done studies of prostate cancer have included age as a covariate because it's such a strong risk factor. Uh, but you know, it's not always the case that including this is going to be a good thing. We could lose power. These three columns are kind of giving you a hint as to what's uh, going on here. Uh, okay. So now things have settled down a little bit. Okay. So this is the correlation between the genotype and the covariate within the cases, within the whole population. This is the correlation between the genotype and the covariate in the cases only. And this is the correlation between the genotype and the covariate and the controls. So in the whole population, these things are completely independent. In the controls, they're pretty much independent because it's such a rare disease. Um, and I'll show you in a second what's going on here with um, the cases. So I'm going to plot these things. I'm going to change g to a, a continuous variable. Here, genos is now normally distributed. No, I mean in the world population. It's, it's oh no, that's that's sorry. This is this. I, I I meant this is what I'm calling the study, and what I mean by popul this is controls, and what I mean by population is actually the whole population from which I drew the cases and controls. 0.04 is very different from zero. Yeah. Um, okay. So so this is what it looks like. This is uh, the the genotypes and the covariates. Now genotypes is normally distributed. This is ascertained data again. And so what's going on is across the whole study, uh, the two variables are correlated. And because we did this through a liability threshold model. Uh, we have this negative correlation between the covariate and the genotypes in the uh, uh, cases. Um, and so there have been a couple talks and papers recently. Um, so, so one of the things Jennifer had, had talked about, for example, was doing PCA in, in cases to uh, uh, look for subphenotypes. Uh, there's been some other papers recently uh, uh, that, that have talked about properties of LD within cases to look for interactions. And, and so this is just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about LD is that both uh, that all causal variants will be correlated uh, uh, in an ascertained study, as well as all environmental sort of uh, uh, factors, and, and that they'll be negatively correlated with each other within the uh, cases. Um, so there's been a couple uh, papers to try to address this problem. Um, so Saron talked about this basically in the context of linear mixed models, where wh when you build a linear mixed model, you're in some sense conditioning on complete genetic background. And that's why you lose power, because it's sort of like uh, uh, you're, you're modeling every other SNP except for this SNP. And, and so uh, you, you again end up with this power loss. So uh, he has some work. There's some work from uh, uh, Alcus Price's group 
um, uh, uh, with another approach. And, and uh, we had a paper a while ago called LT Score that talked about how to do a retrospective. You remember what Saron was talking about, right? We want this is a prospective likelihood. We want to incorporate this probability of ascertainment to make our, our model correct. And so we want to compute a retrospective likelihood. Um, and there's a nice paper uh, that's, I guess, in, in press, maybe, or I guess in, in development from uh, Zara's group, uh, which I think is a really nice, uh, uh, at least mathematically, a lot more satisfying than the, the way we approached it, um, which uh, I guess is going to be coming out this year. Um, I want to do one or two more. Uh, uh, so, so one is, well, maybe I'll just say this one. Uh, so when you residualize on covariates, sometimes uh, uh, th this happens quite often. Uh, somebody will hand you some data where they've said, um, here's the data that I collected, but I residualized out the following thing. So it's been taken care of. Like here's my gene expression data. Um, it's been normalized and I residualized out um, age and gender and batch and, and one or two other things. So it's been sort of like residualized data, which you're then going to take that residualized data and do associations with. So that, that's very different than including that as a covariate, just residualizing on, on one thing. Um, so, so let's look at this situation. We have some covariate. Um, uh, Genos is kind of a misnomer here, but you know, there's just some random variable that's a function of this covariate, and Y is also a function of this covariate. So we have the covariate influences genotype, and the covariate influences Y, and, and I'm going to look at um, a couple different tests. So one is the unconditional test, one is the conditional test, one is where I look at the Y um, where, where I regress out, where I regress it on the genotypes that have been residualized for the covariate, right? So I do the genotypes against the covariate, and I call this G residualized, and here's Y residualized. Um, so so um, this last one here is a equal, mathematically equal to this one here. So doing a regression of the residual of Y and the residual of the genotypes on the covariate is equal to including the covariate. Um, in this regression, and so um, so what happens is is this. So this is what happens when I do this residualized. When I look at the residualized g against y, so we get this massive deflation, right? So you you can't just uh, um, take residualized covariates. Uh, because I'm sort of subtracting out this noise, and so, um, so, so, so you, you, you know, you can kind of, by by increasing the number of covariates you're including in your model, kind of shift the QQ plot around until it it finally looks normal, and you, you know, and then you say, hey, look, I I have this uh, approach that that makes this QQ plot that's right on the line, when in fact, kind of, all you've really done is is you know, included covariates um, uh, uh, in, 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 in the wrong way, right, until you've achieved something that looks good to the reviewers. And they say, oh, wow, the QQ plots, you know, it's right on the line, so there's no inflation. Um, but you cheated to do that. Uh, so, so be careful when you see just, you know, I'm residualizing out and, and not including things as, as covariates. OK. Um, so. I'm just going to talk about this since it's getting really late. So uh, people use PCs or peer factors, all kinds of stuff in uh, gene expression data. Um, this can be really good. So in this example, I had batch effects, and I included uh, 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 PCs. And, and what this simulation shows you is that when you have batch effects, you include PCs. Uh, it can remove bias, and it can increase power. Right. So, so in, in this case, doing PC covariates in gene expression uh, is, is a good thing. Um, there has been recently this kind of uh, uh, trend of people to start doing their EQTL studies from gene expression data, and, and they're faced with this question, how many PCs should I include in my EQTL study, right? And so they start adding PCs, and then they plot um, uh, a, a PCs on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the number of EQTLs that they've found. And so they kind of 
walk along and then they see, okay, I've now uh, maximized and if I start including more PCs, the power starts to go down. And so I'm gonna use 40 PCs because 40 PCs was the most powerful amount of PCs uh, that I could include. And, and so uh, if you remember uh, that sort of false positive example that I showed before where, where we had uh, the genotype influencing something and, and, and uh, uh, it being influenced by environment and environment also influencing the outcome. This can, right, it's still on the board. Okay, so this happens really easily uh, uh, in, in, in PCA. And so if you set this up where, where you have um, some, this genotype that I'm testing, so here's this genotype, and this genotype influences a bunch of the PC, a bunch of the gene expression. So, so I have a gene, I have a hundred genes. This genotype influences uh, forty-nine of them. Influences uh, a genotype influences genes two through fifty, and then I do PCA, and I regress out these first two PCs, um, uh, and and I'm just looking at. Um, um, uh, genos, which is, is uh, and I'm just looking at and gene expression of one is my outcome. So gene expression of one is not at all influenced by the genotype. So we're under the complete null here. And, and uh, I won't run through the simulation, but what happens is um, I add the PC and all of a sudden I detect an association between the genotype and Y. So, so adding all these PCs into these experiments can easily uh, uh, well, easily mathematically. I don't know how easy it is biologically, but, but mathematically it is a very simple simulation, right? It's 10 lines of code or so, and I can come up with an instance where I add PCs and I get great power to detect false positives. Uh, uh, so, right? Um, and, um, okay, I, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it there. There's, there's a lot of other reasons why adding PCs can, can reduce power too, yeah. You know, it's a, it's something it's it's something that, that um, so so Iran and I were talking about this, and I, and and uh, uh, he, he was talking about some theory that exists for which PCs are significant. Um, the problem is apparently that when you do that, you get a huge number of PCs that are statistically significant. Uh, Um, all the PCs will be significant, right? And so, uh, I, yeah, at this point, we've identified it as a problem, let's say. Uh, I have sort of a distaste for adding things until you maximize your objective function, which is, and, and then reporting all of those things as true positives. I, but I don't necessarily have a better idea. Uh, yeah. No, it's not. It's not so hard to get this situation. Um, some some other things that I have here that, that I'm not going to get into are um, um, related to what what I think David uh, Heckerman coined is is proximal contamination. Um, in, because PCs are linear combinations of all of the gene expressions, uh, when you do PCA uh, over gene expression data, the gene that you are, have as your outcome is contained as some element of the PC. And so w w w one of the things we've been thinking about is um, if you did PCA on, you know, like for example, leave one chromosome out style, um, then, you know, in, in some situations like these, you can show that removing the PC, removing the gene before you do PCA really improves your power because you're not modeling it out with the covariate and it has very little effect on your ability to detect uh, batch effects. And, and Joel has been thinking about this sort of out of sample approach because this, this sort of out of sample thing will capture different aspects of the noise and prevent you from say, say uh, uh, overcorrecting for uh, uh, noise. And so I don't know, we have kind of ideas but nothing wonderful to say yet. And so, uh, right. All right, um, is that it? Okay, thanks. thanks.